What is an illness script? An illness script is an organized mental summary of the clinician's knowledge about a disease. It is developed from a combination of reading and personal experience. Information is categorized, such as by pathophysiology, epidemiology, symptom characteristics, diagnostic tests, and treatment. The complexity of an illness script varies depending upon disease prevalence and clinician experience, and the script is updated after each new encounter with the disease. To compare diagnostic frameworks to illness scripts, a diagnostic framework is structured knowledge centered around a common symptom, physical sign, or test abnormality, whereas an illness script is structured knowledge centered around a specific disease. To understand what I'm talking about, let's look at an example, or actually two examples, as illness scripts can be particularly illustrative if used to compare similar diseases. I'll compare the scripts for tension headaches and migraine headaches. We'll first focus on tension headaches. Age of onset is typically 20 to 50, with a female predominance. It is overall the most common cause of chronic headaches. Regarding the clinical presentation, they are usually bilateral and symmetric, mild to moderate in relative severity, last anywhere from 30 minutes to seven days, and can be qualitatively described by patients as a pressure, tightness, or band-like. There are no associated symptoms. The diagnosis is clinical, meaning there is no specific diagnostic test to rule it in. For treatment to abort or stop the headache, NSAIDs or acetaminophen is used, while there is usually no preventative treatment. For migraine headaches, the age of onset is typically 10 to 40, also with a female predominance, and a strong genetic link. They usually start as unilateral but can become bilateral. The pain is relatively moderate to severe, lasting four hours to three days, and is most often described as throbbing or pounding. Migraines are associated with prodromes in auras, and they have numerous distinct subtypes. It's also a clinical diagnosis. Abortive treatments include NSAIDs, tryptans, dopamine antagonists, and ergots, while preventative treatments include beta blockers, antidepressants, and anticonvulsants. Here's another example one taken from my video, An Approach to Syncope. I won't run through it line by line, but feel free to pause it and look it over. It demonstrates how the concept of an illness script is not necessarily only for specific diseases, but it can also be applied to syndromes or categories of disease. Why talk about illness scripts? For many students, creating charts that compare and contrast diseases like this it might feel like an obvious thing to do, and does not necessarily require a specific name for the concept. The most important reason is that cognitive psychologists hypothesize that scripts represent how people actually remember and process information. Let's take an example. Imagine a patient, Sam, a seven-year-old boy who presents to the pediatric clinic with an intermittent cough for three months and a physical exam notable only for mild bilateral wheezing. How do we figure out what's wrong with him? Well, if you had just watched my video on an approach to cough, maybe you would recall this flowchart and work through it, but probably not. Unless we repeatedly use the same flowchart over and over again, our brains are just not good at using them from memory. What you would do instead is compare Sam's presentation to your mental summaries of diseases that can cause a chronic cough diseases that you recalled from the conscious or unconscious use of the relevant diagnostic framework. For example, you might think about upper airway cough syndrome, commonly referred to as post-nasal drip. This is a common diagnosis, but predominantly occurs in adults, not seven-year-olds, has nasal discharge, which Sam is not reporting, and is associated with the physical exam findings that we don't see here. Next, you could consider GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, another common cause of chronic cough. On that illness script, you'll see that it's typically seen in adults, but can also be seen in kids, but it's associated with a sour taste in the mouth and is worse at night and with lying down, none of which Sam describes, and isn't associated with wheezing. So while this script matches Sam's case a little better than the previous one, it's still not great. Finally, you could consider asthma, Asthma's typical onset is in children, 
Check. And it's associated with wheezing. Check. This script seems to fit the presentation much better. In the interest of time, this example of diagnostic reasoning was extremely simplified. In real life, we would be considering many other features of the presentation and comparing those to the rest of the scripts, and we would be considering more than three scripts for a typical patient presentation. Experienced clinicians will do this during the bedside encounter itself, in which they will compare each response during the interview to their illness scripts, update probabilities of diseases in real time, and then use those updated probabilities to inform what question they should ask next and what components to include in the physical exam. This is predominantly done subconsciously. Now let's consider what is the most important information to keep on an illness script. To answer this, we'll need to revisit the concept of key features. To remind you, key features are individual elements of a presentation which are likely to help differentiate one possible diagnosis under consideration from another. Imagine, for example, that we have a patient presenting with a symptom or exam finding that will represent with this star. And this symptom or sign will guide the choice of diagnostic framework, from which we will pull several possible diseases and their illness scripts for comparison. These diseases are composed of sets of presentation features, some of which overlap with others. And since the diseases were all pulled from the diagnostic framework for whatever element is represented by the star, the star must necessarily fall where all three sets in the Venn diagram intersect. If we consider that a key feature is something which, by definition, helps to distinguish diagnostic possibilities, if we have a symptom, sign, or other element of the presentation which fell here on the diagram, which was present in all three diseases under consideration, it would not be diagnostically helpful. It would not be a key feature at all. An element that fell into one of these locations would be modestly helpful, since it would help to reduce the probability of one of the diseases. But elements that fall here, here, or here, only present in one of the diseases under consideration, these are the most helpful. To see what I mean, let's consider a specific example, a patient presenting with acute chest pain. And suppose for this patient, for whatever reason, we are considering as potential diagnoses acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, and pulmonary embolism all life-threatening conditions. Where would various potential elements of a presentation fall on the diagram? What about hypotension? Well, although the mechanism is different in each condition, hypotension can be seen in all three. So hypotension, in this case, is not a key feature and doesn't help here. What about cardiovascular risk factors? Well, they are associated with ACS and aortic dissection, but not with PEs, so modestly helpful. Likewise, if a patient has concurrent dyspnea, that's seen with ACS and PE, but would be unusual in an aortic dissection, so also modestly helpful. But chest pain that's exertional, that's predominantly a feature of ACS. Chest pain that radiates to the back is particularly suggestive of a dissection among these three possibilities. And chest pain that's pleuritic, meaning worsens with deep inspiration, is characteristic of a PE. So while none of these last three findings are truly pathognomonic per se, meaning a finding that's only seen in a single condition, they do strongly support one particular condition under consideration. So in summary, illness scripts are most helpful when they contain maximally distinguishing key features rather than just those that are shared by diseases with similar presentations. There's another critically important piece of information that every illness script should contain a very general idea of how prevalent the disease is in different populations. You don't need to remember specific numbers, just ballpark estimates are usually sufficient. So for example, knowing that among all patients presenting to the ER with a new onset headache, a migraine is many orders of magnitude more likely than a brain tumor or an abscess. But among patients who are elderly with a new onset severe headache, the prevalence of a tumor is not quite so different than that of migraines, and among patients with significant immunocompromise and acute headache, the prevalence of an abscess is not quite so different. To understand why disease prevalences are so important in diagnostic reasoning, consider an analogy that will probably be familiar to anyone who has taken a biostats class. When considering the probability of a disease in a person who undergoes a diagnostic test, 
the post-test odds is equal to the pre-test odds times the likelihood ratio. This general concept can be qualitatively applied to illness scripts. The probability of a disease in the differential diagnosis depends upon the prevalence of the disease in the population to which the patient belongs and how well the patient's presentation matches the remainder of that disease's illness script. In general, when considering different diseases that can present with the same symptom, there can be a greater variability in the prevalences of those diseases than in the variability in their manifestations. What I mean by that can be summarized in a classic clinical reasoning rule of thumb. An atypical presentation of a common disease is usually more likely than a typical presentation of a rare disease. It's very common for early learners in medicine to make the mistake of approaching a patient as if all diseases that they've ever learned about in school present with equal frequency, a phenomenon formerly known as base rate neglect. For example, I might take a student to see a patient presenting with hemoptysis. And after seeing the patient, I'll ask the student what might be causing the patient's symptom. And the first diagnosis the student suggests is anti-GBM disease, an autoimmune condition with an incidence of two per million people per year. And I'll be like, okay, sure, I suppose it might be, but it's probably not. Simple bronchitis, lung cancer, bronchiectasis, and necrotizing pneumonia are all much, much more likely. A common metaphor is embodied in a related but more colorful clinical reasoning rule of thumb. When you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, since a nearby horse is a much more common explanation for hoofbeats, assuming, of course, that you aren't in sub saharan Africa. However, the flip side is that it's common for later learners and even seasoned clinicians to overcompensate for this and make the mistake of not sufficiently considering rare diagnoses, the so-called zebras. A clinician will never diagnose a zebra if they don't consider it a possibility, an obvious phenomenon which contributes to the underdiagnosis of many rare diseases. Overall, an illness script is only as good as the information in it. When compared to novices, illness scripts of experts acknowledge when the classic textbook description of a disease does not match its most common presentation. For example, most patients with cardiac tamponade initially present without hypotension, unlike what's often described in textbooks. Scripts of experts include atypical but well-described variants of the disease. For example, an acute MI presenting as dyspnea or abdominal symptoms without chest pain in women, diabetics, and the elderly. And they include a qualitative predictive value for commonly associated symptoms, signs, and test abnormalities, like knowing an S3 is a much better positive predictive value than negative predictive value in suspected heart failure. The key takeaway points. An illness script is an organized mental summary of a clinician's knowledge about a disease based on reading and experience and update it with each relevant clinical encounter. The most helpful key features in a presentation are those which occur in only one illness script under consideration. The probability of a disease in a patient's differential diagnosis is dependent upon both its prevalence in the population and how well the patient's presentation matches the rest of the illness script for the disease. And illness scripts of experts are distinguished from those of novices by acknowledging differences between textbook and real-world presentations, incorporation of atypical variants, and inclusion of predictive values for commonly observed symptoms, signs, and test abnormalities.